And we are live. So good evening, YouTube, and welcome to the Piper Report. I am happy to have Mad Dodge Productions with me. He's a fellow YouTuber, he has a Twitter feed. Both can be found in the description, so be sure to check him out. So Mad Dodge, welcome. Thank you very much, sir. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> so to start things off, can you tell everyone about your channel, when you started it, why you started it, and what's your end goal? All right, so it's uh, pretty new. I started um, right after Christmas last year, so uh, like December 26th. And then I didn't really put out any content for a couple of weeks after that because I didn't want to use my cell phone. I saved up and got a PC. Um, so that's when I started it. Why? Well, to be honest, um, I used to debate a lot on um, in the group forums and stuff on uh, Facebook. And also I would just post stuff on Facebook. And then I started making my family mad and they started arguing with me and suddenly I'm getting blocked by my own family members. <laughs> so I'm like, well, this is toxic. So I um, didn't deactivate my Facebook, but I have not been on my personal Facebook in three months. I'm done with it. Yeah. I um, now debate with people that want to debate here on YouTube. And we can yell at each other. Sometimes there's some cussing. If you ever watched the Red Eye stream, you would know that. Um, <laughs> but I don't lose family members. And I actually have made a lot of friends. So... It's been uh, really nice. You Where know, I want to go from here. Yeah, go on. Oh, go ahead, sir. No, go on. Um, where I would like my channel to go is if it continues to grow, I will do my uh, red eye streams and uh, political videos. I also want to do some history. I have some Civil War history stuff in the works with my buddy MC. Nice. I know. And, uh, um, no, go on. Oh, and um, maybe eventually I might start a podcast, but I'm not sure. That's my goal for the next year is maybe having a podcast. And, yeah, I know. Um, yeah. I know I uh, my channel, I've actually never really debated anyone in a formal set setting. I mean, I've had many written debates, but never verbal debates. And I actually challenged this one YouTuber named The Progressive Voice because he is – I mean, I hate to insult people, but his channel is his corporate media. He's a kind of a clown. I challenged him, and he gave me a fake email address. Go figure. But, you know, I think that is actually kind of key here is that it kind of brings up what you're talking about, how you actually lost some of your family members because you were debating all the time. And I think in this day and age with so much political hostility, I think it's important to actually have a debate and have an argument with somebody and an actual discussion or else we're just going to continue to grow apart like we are now. Um, yeah, absolutely. And the main thing that really made my family members mad is uh, even though I'm libertarian, I am pro-life. And that means I'm pro-life when it comes to the death penalty and I'm pro-life when it comes to abortion. And the abortion issue is what um, they blocked me over. So I figured I might as well just have the hard, hard debates over here on YouTube. You know, what's kind of funny about that, actually, is that I know, for instance, Austin Peterson, he actually, he's libertarian. He actually changed his view on uh, on abortion. He's no longer pro-choice. Pro he's uh, pro-life now. I know many libertarians view, you know, get government out of health care, and that would coincide with the, uh, with, the, with the concept of abortion. But the way he looked at it was that essentially you are denying that unborn child's basic liberty and their right to live a normal life. And if you kind of think about it too, like what constitutes life and death? Well, if you die, the doctor declares your time of death after the heartbeat stops. Well, the heartbeat stops in the, in the, in the womb around six weeks. So if you want to be, go based on logistics, your actually, abortion is actually killing a life. But I won't get into all that, but that's kind of the theory. I think that's, what, that's why he's advocating now for pro-life as a libertarian. Yeah, absolutely. And he's actually the guy I wanted to uh, pull it out at the convention. But yeah, that's a little off topic for the questions you sent me. So, And it's a real hot button topic. We could probably um, talk about it the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I noticed too, though, on your channel, I am not criticizing here, but you pretty much just do hangouts, right? Live hangouts. Do you do like any uh, personal editing videos or anything like that? Now, um, if you go back to my beginning videos, my biggest video so far was on uh, Judge Napolitano when they were saying that, um, when he got fired. Now they let him come back to Fox, but he did get fired for a little bit or suspended. 
Okay. And that's my biggest video, and that was edited. That was edited with Camtasia 9, and I fell in love with it. Now, that program is $300, and I have Jeez. six kids. So um, I haven't been able to buy that program again. Um, in the chat is Coffee with Comment. He told me about a free program, Active Presenter. I'm going to be messing with that, and uh, I think I have a uh, Rand Paul video coming out in the next day or two. Yeah, nice. I know I started with. Uh, I, I know I started with um, uh, Filmora, and that one was good for like a newbie. You can kind of understand the basic concept of video editing. But now I use uh, Cyberlink Power Director, and I like it a lot. It's nice, but I wouldn't mind upgrading to something that's more professional. I heard. Um, I don't know, I kind of heard hit or miss about, not Windows Movie Maker, but I think Adobe, something with Adobe. Yeah, I haven't tried Adobe. They have a Creators uh, Cloud with, uh, with uh, Photoshop and a video editing program and all that stuff, but I haven't tried it. Um, I am doing, I did have a free trial of uh, PowerDirector. And what I like to do is I like to record my screen and go through the news story. And uh, I tried to do that with it, and it just, uh, I hit record, and then it hit stop on its own. So I don't know what was really? going on with that. It was kind of buggy. Yeah, I know. I, I have that, too. It came with uh, software, PowerDirector. I also use iSpring Cam 8, and it's free, actually. And uh, I use that now all the time. So for free software for a screen recorder, I recommend iSpring Cam 8. It's it's very well done. Um. Later on, will you put a link for that in the side chat, like after the interview yep. or whatnot? Because, uh, right. yeah, I was going to fiddle around with OBS and uh, Active Presenter to try and make that next video. But if that works better than OBS uh, Recorder, then I'll do that. Oh, well, when I was talking with Coffee with Comment, we did our interview. Before that, he mentioned OBS as well. And if I ever start instituting a podcast, which I would like to do eventually, I might have to definitely look into that. We'll just have to see what happens. But I still want to invest in a green screen yet. But I'm in the process of moving to a different city, and I have an apartment and a condo. I'm paying for both of them now. So I'm kind of busy next few weeks here, but hopefully things settle down soon. It's called subletting, man. Rent one of them yeah, out. I'm, <laughs> I'm working on it. All right. But anyways, what is your – no, I kind of hate giving labels out, but just kind of understand where we are. What is your political affiliation? Like, what are your political proclivities? Well, I usually call myself a classical liberal. Um, the people I stream with call me an anarcho-capitalist, which I don't think I am. But um, now that the Libertarian Party is kind of splitting in half, half of it's going with Tom Woods and uh, Jeff Deist and the Mises Institute, and half of it's going with Nicholas Sarwick and the Cato Institute. I don't know, man. Like, there's a civil war going on in the Libertarian Party right now. Yeah, that was actually my next question I was going to ask you about that. Do you think, like, what's happening? Do you think it's dying? Do you think it's expanding? Yeah, I'm not... Oh. <laughs> Continue, I guess. <laughs> um, I think it's splitting in half, and... There's, you know, the big L party, as they call it, you know, the Libertarian National Party um, might be might be dissipating, man. Maybe somebody like Tom Woods or uh, could uh, start a new party. I mean, I don't think they can call it the Libertarian Party at that point, but it could have the same uh, ideals. You know, I also think that there is or there will be some type of maybe political resolution for lack of a better word like i think right now populism is taking effect in this country and it's not just based on the people's party or what the, who the people want as president but actual for every party i mean there's a democratic party which is kind of diverting into separate entities republicans are separating the tea party into moderates and now libertarianism experiences the same thing i wonder if this is just a new fad with the populist the populism in the country or if this is actually a taste of things to come, if we're going to see more political um, deviations happening, and not just from the populist party, but from every single political party. I mean, that's something, I guess, I'm curious to see what happens. Well, I think the main problem is um, Sarwick and his ilk. One, they uh, kind of robbed Austin Peterson of the nomination 
in favor of Gary Johnson. I heard there was some fishy business going on where some money exchanged hands. I can't prove it. I wasn't there, but, you know, Austin was there. Um, and I also think they're pandering to the left way too much. They're going after Trump like no tomorrow, when really, between Trump and Hillary, I'll, I'll take Trump any day. Yeah. And uh, for those who don't know, that baby crying in the background, that is actually me. So sorry about that. No, but... uh. Oh, she wasn't crying. She wasn't crying, <laughs> but yeah. No, but anyways, what I was going to say here, I, I do find it interesting that, I mean, if, if you base it off of, of um, the demographics, the Libertarian Party is actually expanding. If you compare like 2012, they had, I think, a couple million votes. This year, they had like six million votes. But I was kind of thinking about that a little bit when I was... uh. I was kind of contacting you regarding this, and I wonder if it's actually due to the growth of the Libertarian Party or because of the dislike of the candidates like Trump and Hillary. I wonder if next election, if we're going to see the Libertarian Party continue to expand or if we're going to see their numbers slowly decrease now that it's not Hillary versus Trump anymore. Um, who do you think the party will nominate? I know it won't be... Um Peterson, he switched parties, and he hopefully will be um, a congressman, or is he running for Senate? Senate. I hope he beats uh, Claire McCaskill. He has to be get the Republican nomination first, but if he can vote against Claire, or debate Claire McCaskill, he will destroy her. I was actually going to do a video on her. Like She's the 22nd richest person in Congress, yet uh, she thinks like private, normal citizens, average citizens, should have uh, their own private jet. It's like... She has no idea about the livelihoods and what people, average person, is experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think Austin Peterson would be a great challenger to her. I really hope he does actually make it. You know, I would one-up her and say I think every private citizen should have a tank. <laughs> <laughs> actually, that kind of brings me up to a different topic that um, it's kind of random here, but what do you think about – Trump removing, and he, I think Obama did an executive order where he basically limited what the military could sell the police in terms of weapons. And I think Trump actually altered that. I think now the military could sell like tanks to the police force. Do you agree with that concept that it's we should sell weapons, that those types of weapons to our police? No, I don't. Um, our citizens, yeah. And if you go out like that dude, okay, I know somebody in the chat, probably coffee or red beard, or like, remember freaking L.A. or wherever the hell it was, that guy with the tank running over cars and he got stuck on the medium. Remember that like 15 years ago? No, but go on. <laughs> Not, oh, look it up, man. Like it happened. Somebody stole a tank from the National Guard and they went on a rampage with it. Um, and if just a normal guy has uh, military equipment. What's going to happen is if the military decides, you know what, we're going to initiate martial law because um, here's an example, Virgin Islands. They went door to door three days ago, taking confiscating weapons. That is the United States territory. They are covered under the United States Constitution. If they had enough weapons to tell the National Guard to go F themselves, then it would not have happened, would it? Yeah. That's kind of... um. That's actually kind of my thought as well. I kind of refer back to Thomas Jefferson. Uh, liberty or a liberty is when the government fears the people. I, for, I forgot the other part of the quote. I can't remember it. But yeah, basically, the, the, it, it should be the government that fears the people. That is a true liberal free society is when the government fears the people. And that is why the Second Amendment is so important. And that's why I don't want any type of gun regulations at all. People think that, uh, I'm kind of going on a little tangent here, just go with me. People think that, you know, gun restrictions will actually uh, prevent crime. But the statistics show that 98.6% of mass shootings happen in gun-free zones. So why would you want to create more gun-free zones? The answer isn't doing that. It's complete opposite. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Red Beard in the chat um Hey, man, I agree with you. If you open up sales from military surplus to everybody, including police departments, I'm okay with that. Yeah. I sound. will agree with you there. And Captain Coldpile says, tyranny is when the people, that's what it is. Tyranny is when the people fear the government 
a liberty is when the government fears the people. And it seems like we are devolving. The country is devolving away from that mentality. I mean, that was what this country was founded on. The idea of liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, just free enterprise in general. And now we are experiencing more government control, more government regulation of our lives in every possible sense, from healthcare to to the economy. I mean, we have Keynesian economics happening now almost on a daily basis. I mean, we have to actually divert and regress. I hate saying the word regress because regressive is a bad word, but re regress back to our founding principles. And this country can turn itself around. Yeah, that's why I don't consider myself an ANCAP. I don't want to burn the system down and create a new libertarian utopia. I want to go back to the Constitution, and then we can argue from there if we should go back to the Articles of the Federation, which I would probably argue for. But we can't have that argument until we're back to the Constitution. So let's take it one step at a time, guys. I think that's why um, a convention of states may have to kick it in the gear and get going. I think we have 12 states so far. We need 38 for them to actual, actually create their own amendment to the Constitution. Yeah, but that's kind of scary. Um, they went in not to change the Articles of Confederation. They went in there to improve it, and they, they scrapped it, and they created a whole new document illegally. It, was, the, it had to come back and about? ratified by the states. Um, the Constitutional Convention was not a Constitutional Convention. It was to uh, fix the Articles of Confederation. And they just locked themselves up in Philadelphia and changed the whole darn thing. Well, wasn't uh, the Articles of Confederation, though, didn't that uh, abuse the smaller states? That's why they decided to reformat it and create the Constitution. Wasn't that has something to do with it? Um, my impression was that it didn't give enough power to the federal government. It gave too much power to the states. So nobody, no state was paying the war debt off or paying their taxes up to the federal government. They were keeping it all localized. Um, to, that, to, that, go on. Yeah, um, I'll, I might have to look into it again too, um, but that was my understanding when I read about it. No, you're, you're probably right. I was just thinking, if I remember correctly, that it basically the smaller states were getting screwed. So then there was the Missouri Compromise, I think it was called, which basically was a catalyst for the Constitution. And But oh, my no. history could um, be a Missouri, little off here. You are. Uh, the Missouri Compromise was in the 1840s um, or 50s. It, if it was in the 50s, it would be early 50s. And it um, made Missouri a uh, slave state and it made Maine a union state. They kept the um, slavery issue. They kicked it down the road, and then the Civil War happened. Yeah, Maybe I'm if, way too into history. Uh, go ahead and ask your next question well, before I, I go say, on. I'm, 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 pr I'm probably thinking of uh, either the uh, Connecticut Compromise, maybe, I'm thinking of. or But anyways, yeah, screw it. So what are your thoughts on the welfare state and entitlements in general? All right, um, this one, when I read it, I already knew um, what I was going to say to begin with. Um, which entitlements? Basically, food stamps, welfare, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, see, there's a division there, though, because people paid in to Social Security. You and I have paid in to Social Security. So that is not really um, welfare. That is something that we paid into, and they stole the money and spent it on other stuff. So um, I wouldn't, I would phase Social Security out and try and create private bank accounts, like George Bush was saying, as I think he ever had. <laughs> well, that's uh, okay. Let's let's go with that a little bit then. So, what are your thoughts on? Here's my suggestion. Essentially, you would have to grandfather everyone in who has already paid in Social Security. And then you put a cap on it. So starting from this date, no longer will these newborn babies have to pay in Social Security. You grandfather those in who are there, you pay them off, and then you get rid of Social Security in general. I can get behind that. I don't know if uh, Congress or the Senate would, but I can agree with you with that. Uh, when it comes to welfare. Oh, go ahead. If you're going to expand upon that, go for it. I was going to say, in theory, that would make the most sense because you, I hate to say it, but Social Security 
is dying. There's no way we can properly sustain it. To do so, we have to keep on printing money, which just inflates our prices and devalues our dollar more and more. And sad thing is, though, that our our congressional uh, congressmen, congressional senator, congressional Republicans and Democrats, they are so dedicated to the special interests, and they know that they don't want to lose votes. They don't want to lose votes, so they have to keep on with this charade of Social Security and welfare. And I'm kind of circling back here to, to the Convention of States. That's why if we would actually institute a Convention of States, the very first thing I would support would be term limits on Congress to get them out of there. Oh, yeah. Oh, but you could do term limits with an amendment if you got enough people to back it. Rand yeah, Paul but... See right now. And that's at yeah. least one. I don't know about anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But uh, no, for mine, I actually did a video on this a while regarding uh, welfare entitlements. And the thing with welfare is that it basically appeases laziness. Now, that, that may sound harsh, but the reason why we have been in poverty, essentially the same percent of people in poverty today as it was in the 1960s when LBJ did his... Uh, his new new deal if you will and it, it doesn't work we know it doesn't work because part welfare entitlements essentially allows you to not have to care about actually getting a decent education about studying in school about waiting till you're married to have children and if we actually take that away from them that might sound harsh but if we actually take that away from them you will see more incentive for people to want to actually have a decent normal life a life where they can sustain themselves um, let me pay, play devil's advocate for a second, though. Um, would you reinstitute debtors' prisons then? Because all these people, if they lose their job and there's not any safety net at all, they're going to take out loans that they can't pay based on the income they were just making. And then they're going to owe the banks and go bankrupt. And then they'll find a crappy job and they'll repeat. So I are you going to lock these people up in a debtor's prison like they did in the 1800s? I think you would have to probably weave it out. Yeah, I don't think you could just stop it like that. It's kind of a tough, kind of actually a tough call on that. You would have, you, I mean, your point is valid. You just bring it up. You call these people off. A lot of them are going to be pissed. I mean, they're probably even more um, crimes at first because poverty and crime are kind of directly proportional. So that actually is a actually is a good point on that. You'd have to maybe phase it out over time a little bit, but then it, that brings back the problem we were discussing earlier. When you phase things out, it's not as easy to completely remove them because people still become accustomed to them. It's almost like you have to strictly cut it, so then people actually have to start afresh. But no, you know that is actually is, that's a good question. Actually, uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um. Yeah, in Redbeard, you're right. Responsible people don't do that stuff. I'm trying not to cuss. It's not my channel. I don't know. The Piper reports uh, the uh, stance on cursing, so I'm trying not to cuss. But Redbeard, um, what are you gonna do? Because these people are going to do that. That's what happened when um, when uh, the whole payday loan scandal. What in '08 or whatever? Um, maybe before that where they were giving out these loans with sky high interest rates and everybody was grabbing them up and then nobody could pay. So then the loan companies ended up going under and nothing happened to the people that took the loans. Really all they have to do is go file for bankruptcy. I think what you'd have to do though, is you can't just get rid of welfare entitlements. You would actually have to restructure the banking system for sure. Get the power out of the fed, have them stop fractional reserve bank. And you would have to basically, do a complete change. You can't just get entitlements with our banking system the way it is, but I still think there should be a safety net, but those should be for people that are handicapped. You know, people that actually have a, that have no choice but to suffer the way they are. There's, there, there's a Brookings Institute. I believe it was Brookings Institute that did a study that says if, if you do three things, you have a 75% chance of entering the middle class and if you don't do this, and there's 2% chance that you still enter poverty. The three things are you finish high school, you get a full-time job, and you wait till the age of 21 to get married and have children. If you can do those three things, you will actually most likely be in the middle class. 
I think that's the biggest part of poverty these days is that it's from black families. And I'm not being racist about this, but the fact is that the male knocks up the woman instead of staying around with her, he leaves her. And then he goes and commits crimes sometimes to help his family or sometimes just to do it in general. So then the woman is stuck with a child now by herself and then she needs the government assistance. So I think you definitely would have to, uh, I mean, if they can actually follow that, if they can actually follow those three rules that would help them, whole thing, they, they, why would they want to follow those rules when they just get entitlements now? There's no point, there's no incentive for them to actually try to change their life. I think ending welfare and ending entitlements would give them that incentive back. Um, okay, full disclosure time. My son was born when I was 20. I am now 32. He was 12 years old. I had, um, he was taken at birth because of my ex. She had a prior case with DHS open. I got custody back of him in six months flat. Now, I did need help. I was on what they call TANF here in Oregon for a while. But I picked myself up and I got out of it. I got lucky. I landed a job and they taught me how to program for the CNC machine, which is now what I do. Um, so there is an incentive. It's called, it's your life. You don't want to just, you know how much you get for one child in the state of Oregon? You know how much rent is in Eugene, Oregon? 800 no. for a one bedroom. Okay. You're not, you can't even afford a place to live on welfare in Oregon unless you have multiple kids. Now that being said, my ultimate way to fix it would be to stop with the federal government level, kick it all back down to all 50 states. So what, what you're going to have happen is Texas, uh, maybe Nevada, states like that are going to pretty much cut it off completely. And then states like California and Oregon are going to keep it. And then it's going to balance out because the states that keep it and they keep raising it up, they're like, whatever, you don't have to work. Here's $2,000 a month. And then they're going to have to fix it. So the easiest the way to make, make entitlements go away would be to stop it at the federal level. No more federal tax dollars. The problem with that, though, is that entitlements already in welfare are unsustainable in terms of funding. So the, the state level, they're not going to be able to afford it themselves through their state taxes. They're going to have to borrow money from the federal government, a.k.a. the Federal Reserve. So until we can actually regulate the Federal Reserve or change the banking system, those states will still be able to receive the money to fund these programs. So I think that's kind of the big problem with that too. I mean, I'm a state's person. I am for the 12th Amendment. I believe the state should have more power. I, I believe in f federalism. But at the same time too, how can I say this? At the same time too, there has to be some oversight by the federal government that mixes things up a little bit. It changes things from the way they are because as we can see now, welfare isn't working, entitlements aren't working, it's unsustainable. Everything we are devolving into a, into a society where our dollar is going to collapse eventually. And now, especially now with whole China back in their petrodollar by gold, the US is gonna be losing a lot of its credit here. So this is, I guess, jump in here a little bit, help me out here. I'm kind of going on a tangent. It's just, um, things are, things are they're confusing right now. It's states that have legalized marijuana could pay for their welfare system if they took that tax money they are making and put it there. But they're not. They they want to have a surplus that way they have an excuse to spend more money on other stuff. And really they don't have a surplus. They're taking federal dollars and their tax revenue from what the feds consider illegal. So they're having their cake and they're eating it too. I would put an end to that. Dollars, if you want legalized marijuana, which I am very in favor of, take your tax dollars from that and throw it into all your um, your roads and throw it into your welfare system, your schools. Because Colorado made a billion or more dollars on just marijuana in a year. Come on now, that's a lot of money. Yeah, I could see that. The problem with that, though, is can you actually, with pot, I mean, a billion is a lot, but can you actually afford the entitlements you want just by legalizing a drug, for instance? Is there actually enough funds for that to happen? I mean, what you said is essentially conjecture, unless there's actually studies that show 
how much you can afford with this and this, especially with our dollar devaluing every single day due to the Federal Reserve and global inflation of us um, subsidizing and monetizing foreign debt always, which still surprises me always still do that. Isn't the goal eventually to not have it? So I would say good, they can't afford it. I, I mean, flat out, you got to budget more. You got to cut people off and you got to lower food stamps and you can't give out freaking recreational passes. Um, I heard like some people I know freaking did it and they were giving out passes for kids at um, $50 a pop to ride the bus for free and go to Splash. What the heck? This is federal tax dollars. I so mean, there's a lot of programs that could be cut out. That circles things around then. I'm going to play kind of devil's advocate here then. If you're essentially saying that the states then should learn a budget, they should learn to uh, re eliminate and remove some entitlements, why not just let the government do that themselves? Why can the government mandate what entitlements can be followed since they, they're the ones that balance the federal budget? They're the ones that are in control of our current budget and financing system. Because they shouldn't be. The states should be in control of most of everything um, within their state borders. So if a state has a welfare program, they should be funding it. If a state has a school program, they should set, set the curriculum and fund it. The federal government never used to do this. It's a new thing within the last 100, 150 years. That actually, I think that's kind of the problem too these days is that people now depend on the federal government to do just that, to oversee the states, oversee these welfare programs, oversees these these uh, funds from the government, just going for useless, I guess you could say, uh, spending bills and departments that really don't need the money. So I guess my kind of my response to your comment there is that I, I agree with that. I agree the state's rights, but a lot of people now, they look at the federal government as essentially their big brother to help them out in their times of desperation. How do you how do you change their opinion about the federal government that federal government should stay back and the state should take over and they should use their chosen representatives to um, create their own, I guess you could say targeted entitlements or create your own budgets and your own policy proposals that that state specifically needs. Well, don't the people change their opinion every eight years anyway? I mean, really, um, all the freaking Democrats um, were pro-war with Obama in office. Now they're anti-war. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, society changes. Like, I saw a meme one time. It was like some people coming out from underneath a bunch of rocks or out of a cave. And it's like, oh, this is where the anti-war li um, liberals have been for eight years. Like, they're back. <laughs> You know, uh, before I uh, change, before I change topics here, I was going to say to you, I did a video in the past. Uh, you know, I find out funny how progressives and those on the left now, they all of a sudden love uh, the idea of um, federalism now, you know, to give states rights back. Before, during Obama, they didn't care. They let Obama do whatever he want using his phone and his pen. But now all of a sudden that Trump's in office. Oh, no, we have to stop. We have to give states their uh, give states their rights back. 12th Amendment. Ha ha. Yeah, um, well, it's Tenth Amendment. I I wanted Tenth to correct Amendment. you the first time, but I gotta right. correct you this time. Yeah, go ahead, <laughs> go ahead. Feel free to feel free to. My history is a little off, I admit. But uh, no, it's the pendulum sw um, swing, right? They like at one moment the Republicans are in office, they're like, "Woohoo, federal government! Yeah, you'll protect my guns." And then it swings back to the Democrats, and the Democrats are like, "Woohoo, federal government! You'll take away their guns and protect my marijuana." <laughs> like these people don't get it. It's one party, guys. Like really, they're doing this on purpose. All right, and uh, change of topics here. What are your thoughts on the recent Comey revelations? Oh, that he wrote a memo um, exonerating Hillary before he even interviewed her. Yep, and sixteen others. Um, I think he should be arrested. That's the uh, breach of justice, or whatever they call it. Or at least conflict of interest. Like he shouldn't have been if he wasn't gonna pursue it, he should have kicked it down to the next guy down, the um assistant director of the FBI or whatever 
Yeah, but that's, uh, that's, that's Chad McCabe and uh, his wife donated to the DNC and support Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Okay, so okay, so third in command. I mean, we gotta yeah, find right? somebody. <laughs> no, I, I posted a video on my channel. Uh, I think a week ago or so, and it's it's a hearing that Comey was in, like I think a year ago about. And one of the questions by Congressman Lat Ratcliffe asked him, "Did you make up your decision about Hillary Clinton's innocence or guilt before or after you interviewed her?" And he said, "After." Well, now we know he was under oath when he said that. Now we know that this is not true that he actually already drafted his memo long before he interviewed her and 16 others. Now, here's the, uh, the counter argument to that is that, yeah, but Comey may have drafted his memo, but he could have maybe drafted two different memos. To, he wasn't sure which one, to, uh, which one he's going to use, but I find that bullshit because, I mean, who does that, honestly? In my mind, he had his decision figured out long before the investigation was even getting going. Yeah, I think so also, but the who does that thing, I mean, I've never been the director of the FBI. I don't know what they do. Maybe they do do that, you know? But w w wouldn't the other one leak out then to help support his argument, to help support him? Because right now people think that he is a shill for Hillary Clinton. So wouldn't it be better if that document, that memo leaked out to help reinforce his narrative? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, Trump should probably press charges. I think he can. He could uh, direct the um, attorney general to uh, look into it, correct? Yeah. Uh, Sessions could look into it, but Trump can't make them press charges. But one thing I think is also important to note here, too, is that Comey's connections with the Clintons have been going on for a while here. First off, he was the one that investigated uh, – uh, I think parting gate with Bill Clinton. Eventually, he found it uh, not guilty. His brother is Peter. His brother works for DLA Piper, which was the law firm that worked with the Clinton Foundation. Comey himself used to work for Lockheed Martin, which was a subsidiary of the Clinton Global Initiative. So it's hard for me to actually view him as an impartial uh, director and investigator because just his past background, I think there's just too many ties with the Clintons for him to actually do an honest investigation that has integrity. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And um, I'm just curious. I wonder if Glenn Beck did one of those chalkboard diagrams about this. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Probably. You know, but it just kind of brings me up. This You kind of mentioned this earlier, too. And I'm kind of curious on your thoughts. Why don't you think, I guess people in the chat, too, maybe you can answer this as well. Why don't you think Trump is directing his DOJ to investigate Comey, to investigate Hillary Clinton, all these emails. It seems like after the election, he basically completely just ignored Hillary Clinton and her alleged transgressions. Why did he all of a sudden change? Like, why doesn't he want to prosecute her anymore? Okay, um, coffee with comment and red beard. You're probably gonna attack me in discord after this interview, but here's my thoughts, Piper. Um, I think it's because he's been friends with them all along, and he has been. There's pictures with them together. He donated to their foundation. He was a Democrat for 30-plus years. Yes, people can change their mind. But uh, I've been a libertarian for about 10 years, and I don't see me changing my mind anytime soon. And that's 30 years he was a Democrat in New York, of all places. New flipping York. All right? That's, that's the center for... You know, back room deals, <laughs> handing off money, and I don't know, corruption. It's either New York or Chicago that's number one in corruption in government. Um, I don't think he ever intended on doing anything to her. I don't think he really intended on winning. I think it kind of happened. Did you see the look on his face when he won? <laughs> that didn't look like a guy that just won the race for president. That was actually a pretty that good like look. A guy that signed his death. No, I don't know. That was a pretty good look. So you think then it has to do with his, basically his ties with friendship with the Clintons, or do you think there's another theory that he basically doesn't want an investigation into Hillary because it could possibly lead to some of his alleged illicit activities as well? The, um, I don't think he did anything wrong leading up to um, running for president. I don't think he's that stupid. His son and his son-in-law, maybe. Um, I don't think he's that dumb, but look back 15 years from, um, you know, look 15 years back. 
yeah, I'm sure there's something. I'm sure he bribed somebody to build a casino in um, City. You know what I mean? See, there's a that's actually there's a theory too. I'm like I'm gonna say this again. This is just conjecture. There's no actually proof of this, but there's a theory too that he met with Bill Clinton before the election. I think that can actually be proven. I think he did in fact meet with Bill Clinton. And the theory is is that they basically worked out some type of deal together that Donald Trump. Now this kind of goes on the conspiracy end, but Donald Trump is going to essentially destroy the Republican Party. So then Hillary Clinton will win, and the Democrats would uh, fix their uh, how they're down 1,000 elected seats since 2010. Do you do you do you have any credence towards that? Um, I actually haven't heard that theory. Um, other than I did hear something about him meeting with uh, with uh, the you know Bill Clinton, the ex president. Um, I haven't heard anything else about that, so I couldn't comment on that. Yeah, I would have to then uh, agree with your kind of answer like that. I I think. I hate to say it, but Trump did play politics during the election. He said what his crowd wanted to hear, and they wanted to hear him say lock her up. But after he was elected, I don't think he had any intention of prosecuting her. But the thing is, I mean, the more she attacks him, the, and, you know, the, the more she denigrates his campaign, I don't know. I mean, I can see Trump as getting annoyed and maybe eventually – striking out against her, you know, getting the investigation going again, or maybe do it just to support his base who have been calling for it for the last two years. Yeah. Uh, politically, it would probably be the right move to make. Um, at this point, his back's against the wall. He has North Korea on one hand, Russia on the other, and the fake news just attacking him. So he's got to do something. He's got to pull a rabbit out of his hat. Unless these hurricanes are his rabbit, he didn't plan on them, okay? He didn't make them happen. But if he goes there and he shows solidarity with American people and he helps them rebuild, spending billions of dollars, but we'll leave that alone, um, it will help him politically and it will get some of the, the cheap shots that are coming in to back off. Let's be honest about something. The hurricanes were caused by climate change and global warming, 100% guaranteed. <laughs> Sorry, are, I had are, are we really going there? No. Oh God. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I heard that. I was like, oh my God. Like, who is this new El Gore saying this crap? Seriously. Oh, okay. Good. I was like, some libertarians really like they really do fall in there and believe that. And I was like, no, not you. You joined the dark side. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I, I was actually, but I saw Trump down in um Harvey or not Harvey down in Houston during Harvey. And I, I was watching CNN and MSNBC during that because I wanted to see their reactions to that. And their response to it was like, so this is kind of nice of Donald Trump to do this, but this doesn't change the fact about blah, 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 blah. And I hope this is a learning experience for him. I hope he can use this personality and this mentality to change his political decisions in the future. Like they were trying to turn a political that Donald Trump had one good day, but he's still a bad person. The, the only way for him to be a good person is to now completely change who he is and basically give the Democrats whatever they want. Yeah, that's not going to happen. I see Trump as a modern day Andrew Jackson. Um, you know, maybe if he kills the bank, that is. Yeah, he'll get he won't. It makes me mad because during the campaign, he was against the Federal Reserve. He was for auditing it. He he did not like Janet Yellen. Now, all of a sudden, though, he said Janet Yellen is a good person, a really very smart woman, and he's not pushing for the out the Fed bill at all. So I'm kind of disappointed. That was my main thing. I was so happy when he said that we're going to out the Fed. We're going to call Janet Yellen, I think. Uh, it, it, I think it was a bad name. He basically insulted her intelligence, and he kind of shied away after that, though. I want to know what reports he gets because he changes like all these presidents. They change immediately after they take office. Like what is sitting on their desk that makes them change so drastically? Yeah, I heard um, a rumor. I think it was. I think it was on actually on the on, on the uh, Glenn Beck radio program back in the day, and I think Ronald Reagan he was for ending the Fed. Now, again, this is what I heard. I don't know if it's true or not. He was for ending the Fed or at least cracking down on their power. And then while he's in office, his second year in office, I think it was, a couple people from the bank visited him. And after they talked with him, 
he completely changed his decision about the Federal Reserve. I wonder if that's true or not. If so, I mean, I think it just further illustrates the type of power that they actually have in this political circus that we have. Yeah, and there is a deep state. That is the oh, fact. Yeah. So the whatever comp- they show the incoming president must really have an effect. I mean, is it like, hey, the Secret Service actually works for us. Do what we want or you'll go out like JFK. I mean, what is it? I'm going to kill your freaking grandchildren and eat them. I mean, what the, what do they tell these guys? <laughs> That's actually a good uh, prelude to our next topic here. What do you think Trump should do about North Korea? This is a hard one. Um, my initial response was, and I did a stream about it, was we should just uh, withdraw, but we can't. We can't do that. We can't let these guys have nuclear weapons and keep uh, throwing them over Japan. See, that's where they violated the non-aggression principle. They threw a missile through Japanese airspace, and it splashed down about 50 miles off their coastline. So now my current stance is no American boots on the ground, but we use American air support and naval bombardment, and we let South Korea and Japan wipe them out. And we hope to God China does not get involved. Because if they do, we better have Russia on our side or hell's to pay. That decision, though, would lead to the deaths of about 6 million South Koreans in a matter of minutes. Unless they could somehow completely eradicate every North Korean missile site, and every North Korean basically army sergeant, and every kind of you know defense they have. There's no really way to completely dismantle the missile systems they have in North Korea. I mean, they're going to respond with a nuke, and their closest neighbor is going to be North South Korea. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to kill six million people at least. So how do you justify that then? Um, I can't. I hope. I hope that the artillery banks on our side of the DMZ are able to wipe out a lot of their um, artillery to begin with. And uh, I. Man, I don't like I don't like these weapons, dude. But uh, what about napalm? What about we just napalm freaking um, a lot of the area? And I don't know. I am strategic strikes. I don't know, man. You know, mine's kind of a I'm kind of the opposite. I was all for I guess some type of military action against North Korea, but I've been watching a lot of the. Uh, he's a YouTuber. I recommend check it out. It's called We Are Change. And I learned some interesting things about that. The first one is, is that there have been, China has actually created three different proposals between North, North Korea and the U.S. And the proposal was that North Korea would stop testing their missiles and make nuclear warheads if America and South Korea would stop doing a military drills together on how to actually take out North Korea. North Korea said yes during it. But the U.S. has said no three different times, twice with Obama and once with Trump. So, I mean, there has been a deal on the table, but the presidents have neglected to sign it. Um, Okay, let's say we do that. We are um, extremely weakening South Korea and Japan at the same time. And the hatred between Japan and North Korea is there and it's real and it's cultural. And it's been around for a thousand years. So I don't know. I don't know. Like uh, uh, Sticks and Hammer, 666. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of him. He's way bigger than both of us. Never heard of him. Never in my life. Not once. Oh, uh, okay. Well, (laughs) I'm joking. He's a libertarian as well. He claims to be. Um, He says that um, if we just back out, then... We're just strengthening their hand, and they're not going to quit their nuclear program. And I, I kind of agree with him. I, why would they? They've won. We we pulled back. That just opens opens them up more to uh, more aggression towards their neighbors. See, but here's does it not? Here's the problem with that, though. Too is that the libertarian philosophy regarding this, and I heard actually on the Ron Paul uh, uh, report, Liberty Report, is that. As soon as a country, a major country, 
gives up their nuclear warheads, their government is always toppled over from the U.S. There's always some type of intervention where we take over. So the fact that North Korea is actually producing these missiles and these nuclear warheads are more in their defense and, uh, as opposed to um, proactive aggression that it's, it's unlikely that they are going to use their nuclear weapons and their warheads to bomb other countries. They're going to, they have them so we don't bomb them. Yeah, man, I don't know. And um, Holly in the chat said uh, that China should handle them. I China has not proven to me that they want to handle them. It, it looks to me like they're their pit bull that they left let off the leash in the last year. They like they're like screw it, you know, go start some stuff, and uh, we'll help you out after the bombs start falling. Well, I'm not That's sure. That's what it looks like to me. I don't know. I'm not sure I agree with that because that goes back to China did broker a deal between them three different times. It was the U.S. that neglected it. I mean, China did actually broker a deal. So I think I, I don't. That, go on. I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. Um, no, go but on. doesn't that deal really benefit them? It it leaves a void that they can fill. They are the strongest. The border Russia has right there is pretty small and minimal. China is a major power in the area. So that helps them to have naval groups no longer training there to take out our um, our missile defense that we have given South Korea and Japan and to leave the area. Well, I could be would wrong. Would that benefit them? I, I would I, agree to that deal if I was China too. I mean, I could be wrong. I have to double check it. But I think the deal that was brokered wasn't – it. I mean, it's still allowed for like South Korea and Japan to still have their uh, naval bases and be able to do their own training programs. It would just the U.S. would not be involved with South Korea when they do their dual um, exercise, military exercises. Okay, Um, you know, I will agree with that deal on uh, one condition. We uh, make Japan and South Korea nuclear. Then they can defend themselves and we leave. See, and that's exactly the point here about North Korea. How do we know that North Korea isn't doing that? They're making nuclear weapons so they can defend themselves. Well, I, yeah, I just said I'll agree. Um, but we make South Korea and Japan nuclear to defend themselves. North Korea gets to do what they want, I guess. And uh, our whole Asian pivot is uh, for naught. Yeah. It was Asian pivot strategy. Yeah, I guess I'll just say uh, my opinion is that I don't think the U.S. should proactively attack North Korea. I mean, I hate to say it because if I'm wrong here, basically what that means is that North Korea, Kim Jong-un, decided to nuke South Korea, for example, and 6 million people have just died because the U.S. didn't do something. But I honestly don't think they will. I think North Korea is doing this for force. They're just trying to show the world that, you know what? We are a powerful nation. And if you try to mess with us, we will attack back. I think it's all for show. And I think that if the U.S. actually stays away from them and doesn't invade them or attack them, I don't think North Korea would do anything but just bluster some more. Um, I, I can't agree with you. They already violated um, Japan airspace, which, in my opinion, violates non-aggression principle against Japan. They have already um, broken into the house, so to stay. They just haven't stolen your TV yet. So then do you feel that it's only a matter of time before North Korea does attack another nation? And if so, what type of attack are you expecting? Do you think a nuke or just missile or what? Because when, whatever happens, as soon as North Korea attacks another nation, North Korea is wiped off the map. There's no – U.S. will get involved, South Korea, Japan. They will literally be wiped off the map. So I guess the question is which country do they hate so much and want to attack so badly that they're willing to completely destroy their own nation to do so and kill everyone in it? Um, I don't think it would be uh, one single attack. Um, rumor is they have about 80 nuclear weapons. I don't know if they have enough ICBMs for those bombs. But let's say they have enough ICBMs for half that. Let's say it's 40. They could, they could simultaneously um, send a missile to Japan. They can hit South Korea. They can hit Guam. They can maybe hit... Um, Hawaii and maybe um, somewhere on the West Coast. 
And I don't know about you, but I live over here in, on the West Coast, and I don't really want to get nuked. <laughs> yeah, it's, so I, mean, I, I don't know. And if I was going to go out in the blaze of glory, that's what I would do. I'd fire everything I had at everybody, even China. Screw them all. <laughs> like you're not going to be around when the dust settles. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to find that article that I was telling you about earlier with uh, Ron Paul. Um, basically, all the countries that gave up their weapons have all then systematically been invaded by the U.S. and overthrown. I can't find it as the moment. I heard I have to look it up after this or something, but I found it really interesting. And it kind of does, in my mind, kind of give credence to, I guess, the philosophy of the U.S. and their police the world kind of situation. Now, I should say this because I know people in the chat are probably disagreeing with me in this. I am all for uh, attacking North Korea if indeed they become such a big threat. But as of right now, I think the only way for them, for us to justifiably attack them is if they attack another country. And in my opinion, I, I don't see that happening, but I could be wrong. I'm ho I hope I'm right. I don't want to be wrong because that means millions of people are going to die, but I hope I'm right. I, but who knows? It's, I guess we'll see what happens in the long run. Um, yeah, before you move on to um, the last couple questions, because we're hitting that hour mark you wanted. Um, what is aggression to you? Um, the people of Japan got a text message saying a missile is on the way. If you have a bomb shelter, go to it. If you do not, go to a subway or go wherever, you know, anywhere to take cover. What if that happened on the west coast of America? A massive text alert says missiles incoming. Wouldn't you consider that aggression, even if it just flew over Hawaii and splashed down an ocean? Yeah, that's a that's a fair point. That's a fair point. But I guess for to, to play um, devil's advocate again, can we really believe that type of uh, text message? I mean, we know that the war propaganda is extensive, and we know that I did a video in the past, twenty seven admitted false flags. I mean, our government, British government. We have all used false flag attacks to justify war. So it's kind of hard to accept that threat as reality until proof is given. Likewise, I don't believe that Assad used chemical weapons, but we were told that he did, and it's a threat, so we, justif we justifiably bombed him. So at the same time, I mean, that, that is true. I mean, if, it, I guess to your question, if we could verify, if we could actually verify that they did send a missile our way, it was proven it wasn't propaganda, then yeah, I would consider it a threat. I, would ha I admit I would consider it a threat, and that would definitely could be a prelude to war. And I agree with you on the chemical weapons 110%. I've argued that on my channel. Um, I may do a lot of live streams, but there's a lot of debate in those live streams. Yeah. So, <laughs> so then, um, but yeah, we can move on since uh, we've, yeah, we've hit that hour mark you were aiming for. So Yeah, I got a couple more here, and then, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so then do you agree with the Trump administration selling billions of dollars in weapons to South Korea and Japan? South Korea, Japan, yes. Um, the, um, the people in the Middle East, these random non-governmental um, organizations, no. But to Japan and to South Korea, they are allies, yes. Just like I would agree to selling weapons to Great Britain. I um I forgot where I heard this from, but I I kind of I'm thinking the same thing here that it's almost like this is just propaganda to try to get more support for the war that will happen with North Korea eventually. I mean, basically, we're giving them more. Um, it's almost like during the Iraq when when we got went to Iraq, we heard. Uh, I forgot his name, but he went to the UN. It's that he was a black dude, the sec secretary of defense, I think, Colin Powell. Powell. Powell went to the UN and for like two hours, he talked about how we knew 100% that the uh, Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. And during that time, the all the media, left wing and right wing, were supporting you know military invention, intervention, all this stuff, and it, it led to war. And if things now, when I see on the TV now, the left wing media and the right wing media are, are both basically proponents of war with North Korea. It's almost kind of like deja vu in a way and a taste of things to come. It's almost like we are building the foundation and the reinforcement to justifiably attack North Korea. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Um, I, I do see the buildup and it is deja vu all over again. But you know, 
I just saw right before this interview on Twitter. We may have a savior, man. Jesus. And he goes we, he goes by the name of Dennis Rodman. He wants to, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he wants to go to North Korea and calm the tensions. In other words, he wants to go play basketball with Kim Jong Un. I say we send him and then we nuke him. How about that? <laughs> I'm going to kick you off my stream now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, all right. he he's like Americans love Dennis Rodman, and we're like, okay, Dennis, go ahead, and then we just attack. <laughs> Who else was over there? I think I think there's one more. Oh, us? Uh, no, no, I was gonna say Segal, but Segal's in Russia. Steven Segal, <laughs> him and Putin are great buddies now. Are you serious? The guy with the yeah. whole that was wasn't he in Rocky? Right? No, no, no that's no. that's Stallone. That's Stallone. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, I was reading about Steven Seagal and what he would do actually on set, he would go up and like kick people in the nuts just randomly. Like he would spit on them randomly. I guess he's a real prick to work with as an actor. So it's probably a good thing he's in Russia. <laughs> I never liked his movies. He did do uh, cliffhanger and stuff like that. No, he didn't. No, he that, did. was that was That was Stallone. That's what I really hate. That's what keeps popping in my head. Seagal, what, what movie did he do? Uh... He was like kind of like a Chuck Norris in a way. He had like action movies, but they were smaller action movies. Uh, uh, all right. Yeah, it, it doesn't even matter. Um, next question. <laughs> hold on. I'm, I'm kind of curious now what movies he did. I'm looking it up. Oh, uh, I, there was one in 1994 on Deadly Ground. I think that was his most famous one probably. Uh, Above the Law, Under Siege. Yeah. Oh, Under Siege it. was good. I remember that one. Alrighty, well, I guess the last question here, which is kind of ironic because Anna finally decided to join me for once, but she comes at the very end of the interview, so she's going to miss all the good stuff. What are your thoughts on Google's further crackdown of opposing viewpoints? I hate it. Um, I really do. I Ron Paul got demonetized, man. Forget about my channel. We cuss and stuff. But Ron Paul? The dude was a congressman. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I saw that uh, Dave Rubin, his channel about him going off the grid like for like a month also got demonetized. And there's one video I saw too where – it was from Styx. Styx did a video basically where a guy who, uh, who does reviews on food, no less, was completely demonetized doing reviews on food. It's like what is the, the, um, the structure? What is the – reasons or who gets demonetized how do you decide who gets demonetized what is the content that has to be uh transgression in essence no and you want to know what's really weird is i don't even think youtube knows so check it out um i looked on my channel one day and all of my videos were yellow literally all of them and i was like well crap okay my judge napolitano video is my best video it has over eleven thousand views i put that in for review Went back the next day, everything is green again, other than my Judge Napolitano video. I'm like, what? What, <laughs> <laughs> what are you guys doing? The complete opposite. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's really funny and I guess sad about it all of it too is that the Young Turks, they seem to just be free from all this um, harassment and all this suppression. They can do whatever they want and they can get away with everything. I mean, I'm not even a Young Turk subscriber yet. Every time I go to a channel, either like Zoo on channel or Tex Texans channel, things like that, on the right, it always says, you may like, and it has a Young Turks, Young Turks, Young Turks. It's like, no, I don't like the freaking Young Turks. I don't want to listen to the Young Turks. Who, who the hell wants to listen to the Young Turks, honestly? Um, I'll be honest. Five uh, years ago, four years ago, I did watch their videos. Now I watch them to tear them apart, maybe. I haven't done a Young Turks video yet, but that would be why I would watch it. Be careful with the trolls if you do one of their videos. They come out of the woodwork. Well, they'll give me views as long as they don't flag me at a high heaven. <laughs> don't give them any ideas, actually. I should uh, delete that from this video. No, I'm kidding. But um, <laughs> all right. I guess that is basically what I have here. Thank you for coming on again for those in the chat and for those who watch this in the future. Once again, I'm with Mad Dodge Productions. Link is in the description. His Twitter handle is The Mad Libertarian. Again, link in the description. So thank you for coming on. It was a good talk.
Yeah, thank you. Anytime, man. And uh, if you ever stay up late at night and want to join the Red Eye stream, dude, you're always welcome. Sounds good. Until next time.